Thank you. And now we're moving back to our The Talk format with gold developer First Mining Gold Corp, who is advancing a portfolio of gold projects in Ontario and Quebec, including the Springpole Gold Project in northwestern Ontario, one of the largest undeveloped gold projects in Canada. First Mining also owns the Cameron, Du Parquet, De Cane, and Pitt Gold Projects, which are all advanced stage gold projects. And here to explain more about the company, including their portfolio of gold project interests and royalties, is CEO Dan Wilton. Dan, the stage is yours. Welcome. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. No, I was... Uh... Oh, but I get to wander. I'm like Mike, I don't have to stand well, yeah, at a stage. And, and that beauty. could get distracting. Anyway, uh, I just want to say thank you all for, uh, for coming. As mentioned, I'm Dan Wilton, the CEO of First Mining Gold. Um, C'est un plaisir d'être uh, à Québec. C'est la, la première fois pendant à peu près 30 ans. J'ai bien passé un été, un, un été ici, il y a 31 ans. Et uh, c'est un, un endroit uh, très proche de ma cœur. And that's all I will do in French uh, for now. So uh, anyway, I'm going to be making a few forward-looking statements as we go here. Uh, as mentioned, First Mining, we're developing a portfolio of gold projects, uh, all of our projects in Canada. Uh, by way of background, the company was uh, established in uh, 2015 by Keith Newmeyer, uh, who is the founder and CEO of First Majestic Silver, and Keith still serves as our chair. Um, and really, when Keith established this company, it was 2015, the equity markets felt a lot like they feel right now, actually. <laughs> it was a very difficult time. Uh, and they decided to try and amalgamate a group of projects um, that people had lost interest in, but they could get at exceptional value. So they built up uh, a portfolio of projects, which uh, we still have here. Um, uh, that they and just about any project in Canada with a million ounces that they could buy for ten dollars an ounce or less, and put together this outstanding portfolio by acquiring eight companies in about twelve months. So uh, from this portfolio, we've uh, moved to bring a few partners in. We'll talk about that on some of our projects. Some of our partners are here today, uh, and we'll also uh, talk about the projects we're moving forward ourselves. First and foremost is our Springpole Gold Project, uh, which is one of the largest undeveloped open pit gold projects in Canada. Uh, on top of that, we have a couple other very interesting projects, including our Cameron Project, which is located uh, just north of Rainy River, Ontario, and uh, a few interesting projects in Quebec, that some of which we own 100% of, some of which we only own a portion of, uh, but hopefully uh, at some point stitching together uh, a bit of a district uh, not far from uh, Ruin Naranda. On top of that, as we've done these deals, we've uh, retained a lot of the exposure moving forward. So uh, in all of the partnership deals that we've brought in, uh, we've retained royalties. And as we've monetized other things in our portfolio, uh, we now have a portfolio of 21 royalties across four countries. And uh, we'll talk about these royalties in a bit, but we're, we're, we're very happy to point out that our partners on our royalties have spent uh, probably $40 million in the last year and a half on exploration on these properties. Um, uh, drilled more than 125,000 meters on our royalty properties. So they're getting better all the time. Uh, why first mining? Uh, we are focused on advancing our Springpole Gold Project. We'll talk about it. It's located about 100 kilometers uh, east of Red Lake, Ontario. So great mining area, great infrastructure. Um, we put out a pre-feasibility study early in 2021 that had a, a net present value just shy of a billion dollars US at a $1,600 gold price. And on top of that, we'll talk about this in a minute too, but it really demonstrates the leverage that that this project and our company has to an increase in gold price. It's got about a five million ounce equivalent total resource uh, and still lots of exploration opportunity to come on top of that as we've managed to consolidate a large part of the Birch Uchi Greenstone Belt, an analog to Red Lake, but just on the other side of the Trout Lake Batholith. So lots of exciting exploration to come at Springpool. Uh, the three projects that we uh, have partners advancing, uh, first and foremost, uh, 
Ateco Minerals, which is the first partnership that we brought in, and Ateco was presenting here today, who are advancing the Pickle Crow Gold Project, which they've done an amazing job on. It's now, they've doubled the size of the resource to about 2.3 million ounces, high-grade gold, in an established past-producing camp with outstanding infrastructure. So if you haven't looked at Ateco, you should look at that one. Treasury Metals is also here. We're the largest shareholder of Treasury Metals. As we combined their Goliath project with our Goldlund project, a couple of years ago, and that uh, we, we built a great team, and, and Jeremy Wyeth, the CEO, has built a great team around him, moving that through pre-feasibility study. So that's, uh, that's coming out shortly. And uh, the third partnership asset is our Hope Brook project in Newfoundland, which is being advanced by Big Ridge Gold. So, um, you know, as I said before, our partners have done in excess of 100,000 meters of drilling on these, on these core partnership projects. And it's a way that we have been able to get real capital put to those projects when we didn't have the capability, predominantly human capital capability, to do it. So uh, we've talked about the royalties. We'll talk a little bit about some of our valuation and benchmarks here. Um, sitting today, a market cap of about 175 million Canadian, uh, 20 million plus cash in the bank, no debt. And when you look at our partnership assets and some of the uh, share issuances to come to us as our partners move these assets forward, um, that all totals about a hundred million dollars worth of value there. So uh, it leaves actually very little value sitting with our primary projects, which is kind of how we like to think about the valuation of first mining. We're sitting today with, uh, with assets that have value well in excess, we believe, of $1.5 billion um, at a $1,600 gold price. And today you're getting all the fundamental value of those 100% uh, owned assets for an adjusted enterprise value of about $75 million. So again, deep value. Uh, and I think what that says, you look at advanced stage projects, and look at where advanced stage projects ultimately tend to trade or get sold. It's really in that 0.5 to 0.9 times net asset value. We're trading right now at 0.07 times. So it gives you a sense of the, of the leverage that we have to just reversion to the mean as a development company. Um, again, trading down at this, uh, at this low end, kind of $10 an ounce, you know, typical metric uh, for... Uh, projects at a development stage or a construction stage where we should be in two years' time uh, is more like $100 an ounce. So lots of leverage to the upside there. We'll just talk a minute about Springpole. Again, one of Canada's largest uh, undeveloped open pit gold projects. Um, we've talked about the economics. The jurisdiction, you know, this is a fantastic place to build a mine. It sits halfway between two historic mining camps where they've been mining since the 1930s between uh, Red Lake and Pickle Lake. Close to infrastructure, we're within 100 kilometers of a brand new built 230 kV power line. And we've got uh, forest and logging roads within 18 kilometers of the project. So really quite close to, to reasonably major centers. Um, what gets us really excited about Springpole is that this is one of very few projects that uh, are capable of producing 300,000 ounces plus a year. So this is a project that is big enough to be meaningful to the largest gold producers in the world. And I think if you look at uh, a list of projects through the world that, you know, you start filtering them by various criteria, you can very quickly get down to a very small number of projects that would satisfy the criteria of 4 million ounces plus of resource, uh, capable of producing 300,000 ounces plus a year, all in sustaining costs in the lowest quartile in a tier one jurisdiction advancing past PFS stage. Add on district scale exploration upside to that, and I think it becomes something that, you know, we are starting to think or getting into the territory that's going to have visibility on that, you know, elusive tier one asset. So a little bit about the economics of the project, very robust. Um, it was scoped with uh, upfront capital of 718 million US in, uh, in 2021. Now, we know we're in an inflationary environment. We know that number is going up. But, uh, you know, one of the things that I think gives us some real comfort here as we take the project through feasibility is that it is a very robust operating cost profile, really driven by the grade of the deposit, which is one gram gold and five gram silver. 
and by the nature of the deposit. So what's unique about spring pool is that it's not a series of veins that you're, you know, two gram veins you're trying to mine to send one gram to the mill, like detour. Uh, it's, it's not uh, malartic, which, you know, has some real variability in the intensity of stock work in different areas. Spring pool is a porphyry deposit. So it is essentially a continuously mineralized blob of mineralization, this intrusive, that when you mine it, it's 150 to 350 meters wide, and it's a kilometer long, and it's 500 meters deep, and when you mine it, you take the whole thing. So we often get asked, why does the world need another one gram ore body in Ontario? You know, there was a time when that was a much maligned thing. When I started in 2019, everyone always asked, you know, tell me why this isn't detour. Like, detour is a disaster, right? That's, it's the worst project ever. Well, by December of 2019, we were being asked, so is spring pole like detour? Because, you know, big one gram ore bodies, once they're built, are very robust. So that's what really contributes to the, uh, to the low all-in sustaining cost here. It's the ore body. It's the fact it's going to be on grid power. And it's got a, about a two to one strip ratio, which makes a huge difference, not just in, in the economics of the project. It also makes a huge difference in the greenhouse gas footprint of this project which not a lot of people understand, but as an open pit mine, your strip ratio is directly your greenhouse gas usage, generally speaking, because most, you know, most people are using diesel trucks. Um, and the one point that I, would, that I would point out here too is just the leverage that the project has to increase in gold price. So the way that I kind of like to talk about it, um, every $100 increase on the gold price in our PFS is basically our market cap in NPV. So it's about $150 million after tax NPV for every $100 increase in the gold price. Put another way, if you were to run the same study at an $1,800 gold price, approximating where we are now, uh, you'd see it's $300 million higher. We don't think that there's gonna be $300 million of CapEx trade-off as we run this project through feasibility. Again, really important leverage, and that leverage comes from the size of this deposit. Also, the other thing we always point out, really robust after-tax and pre-tax payback of this project, which means there is a higher grade part of the deposit in the earlier years of the mine life that really delivers robust payback. So Spring Pole, you know, again, this is a top 10 mine in Canada, and in, in some of the years of its production profile, it's going to be vying to be a top three mine in Canada. Big enough to be meaningful. We've also... Uh, as I said before, we've picked up about 30,000 hectares of contiguous land around us to cover most of this Birch Uchi greenstone belt, uh, which has only ever seen a fraction of the exploration of Red Lake, but very similar geology. Uh, a few past producing mines, which we've managed to pick up or were adjacent to. Um, really four different styles of mineralization to chase here, and our exploration team, led by James Maxwell, who joined us as VP Exploration, um, in October of this past year, uh, is really getting excited about getting on the ground and actually ground truthing a number of these projects. Big geophysical program coming, and we want to have drills turning uh, hopefully this year on, uh, on some of this exploration upside in the Bertucci. So we won't spend too much more time on that. Uh, you know, the project uh, does sit under the bay of a lake, which if we have one thing that, uh, that some investors have trouble seeing past, it's this. Um, you know, this is something that is uh, not unique to this project. Pretty much every open pit mine in the Northwest Territories or, you know, north of 60 has coffer dams and ends up dewatering part of the, uh, part of the open pits. Uh, ours, we actually utilize a lot more, uh, utilize a lot more of the uh, topography and terrain to help us do that. Leaves a really small footprint project. And the reason that we're confident we're able to do this is that our VP uh, Environment and Community Relations has actually permitted two projects similar in nature, where you're talking about uh, lots of, um, of dam and dike footprint around open pits, both the Gacho Quay Diamond Mine, uh, the Meadowbank Mine, and our, our, uh, one of our directors built the Divic Mine in the Northwest Territories, all case studies of far more complicated uh, open pits around water than what we have to deal with at Spring Pool. And on top of that, the team that's moving that forward with us at Wood is uh, very experienced. They've led the environmental assessment on pretty much every big open pit 
uh, project in Ontario over the last 20 years. So I'll just talk very briefly. I've talked about each of these, each of these uh, investment companies, but it, they, our partnership portfolio does give us really good exposure to more upside to an improving gold market, which I think is important. Treasury metals driving toward a pre-feasibility study uh, at the Goliath Gold Complex uh, towards the end of the summer. Ateco at Pickle Crow in the middle of their third 50,000 meter drill program. They've now almost doubled the entire existing, uh, pre-existing um, uh, drilling that happened at this high grade deposit. As I said, they've doubled the size of it and really no sign of that slowing down in terms of, uh, in terms of the ability for them to continue to grow that project. They're doing a fantastic job. Our project interest in Pickle Crow, which is right now 30%, um, we have 20% interest there that's actually carried through to a construction decision. So we're in a very good position that uh, Ateco will continue to drill there and we don't have to contribute until a little bit further down the track. And similarly, Big Ridge, uh, which is drilling at Hope Brook, has uh, some fantastic uh, intercepts. They're about halfway through a program there. Um, and that's a project with a million ounces of, of indicated resource already. So starting to test new areas and take that through initial economic studies as well. Um, and then our royalty portfolio, again, the primary royalties are those partnership assets, but uh, a number of other projects which we've, you know, kind of tried to simplify the structure of first mining over the last three years, focus on where we can make the biggest difference. And so our royalties have... Uh, have, uh, you know, we're sitting today with, I think, a really attractive group of royalties that we don't really get much value for in the market. So with that, I think we'll, uh, we'll pause a little bit and uh, drive on to... Uh... Do we have any questions from the audience? Any questions from the audience? Gabe? Yeah. Hang on, hang on a second. Look, uh, Gabe, you need to sit beside him all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just very quick question. Yeah, I did look at the uh, the numbers close. I just saw that uh, your sustaining capital is only fifty five million on the seven seventy five or thereabouts on the initial capital. Yeah. Typically, most people kind of shove things a bit more into the future. Yeah. Why is it like that? Uh, basically, most of the operating cost things you'd think would be in sustaining capital for us are sitting in operating cost. So okay. uh, part of it was that it was designed uh, in the PFS as a dry stack tailings and waste rock co-disposal. So you don't have tailings lifts, which are usually one of the big elements of sustaining capital. Uh, and then the rest of the kind of more equipment related sustaining capital is actually sitting in operating cost. Does capital include some supplier credits and things like that? Yeah, that was uh, basically the fleet um, we put in as 20% uh, in the initial capital number and then carried lease costs for the remaining 80% in the operating costs. Okay. So thank you. Okay, some of the questions coming through the portal. Uh, I will remind people that we have over 100 people that are sitting and, and watching this presentation on our private portal for accredited retail investors. Um, are you concerned about cost inflation at all? I know you answered some of that yeah. with, with Terry, but that's a big question that's coming through. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we're seeing it all across the industry. I, you know, I think there is, I'd be more concerned if I was halfway through a build right now or right at the outset of a build, because that's where you've seen this real pressure on supply chains. I think in the time frame that we're talking about building, which is, you know, our, our environmental assessment document uh, was published as a draft last week. Um, that, I think, gives uh, a really good sense of this project going forward. We're starting to get comments back from regulators, but we're probably two years from environmental assessment approvals, construction decision kind of after that, so call it 2024 into 2025. I think a lot of these costs, labor cost isn't going to adjust down, it never does, but a lot of the other equipment and supply costs right now, there is a real crunch in these projects being built. I think that subsides because there's a rush of projects being built right now in the industry. And then the next generation of projects after that is actually very thin. You know, Treasury with, with, uh, with Goliath Gold Complex mm -hmm. and Spring Pool, there's not many others in Canada that are not already kind of ready to go in the next year or two that are, uh, are gonna be in the back half of, the, of this decade. Okay, and, and the final question is, what is the leverage of first mining gold to the gold price? 
Yeah, I think, you know, we talked about that with the, uh, with the leverage on Spring Pool. It's just a huge deposit. And so, you know, it's, and, it's our market cap for every $100, basically, Excellent. in fundamental value. And that doesn't count then the rest of the projects that we have, uh, our 100% owned projects in Cameron and our projects in Quebec, where, you know, those kind of dollar per ounce type uh, valuations in a more robust gold market, you're going to see those projects trade up toward $50 to $100 an ounce, which is how we always see them trade. Excellent. So, anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for participating. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Thank you. Uh,